stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Not on our board agenda tonight, we have a very special recognition. And if our board members can join me up front, we will begin. So as many of you know, we have a special uh, presentation for a board member who has been serving on the Red Clay School Board for not one, not two, not three, not five, but 10 years, Dr. Adriana Bone. She has been a fierce leader. She has been advocating for students, staff, and families for a decade. And she has been inspirational to many of us who have joined the board. So we wanna say thank you. We have a plaque here for you with our deepest appreciation presented to Dr. Adriana Bohm in recognition of your 10 years of service, dedication and commitment to the Red Clay, Red Clay Consolidated School District Board of Education. Thank you for your leadership. Don't go anywhere, Dr. Bohm. We have our community leaders here tonight to make some presentations as well, if you guys would come forward. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Um, before we have Senator Lockman, who is here with us from the General Assembly, we have uh, Councilwoman Janet Kirkpatrick representing uh, District 3 for County, uh, Newcastle County, and Councilmember Jay Street, who is here um, as well. I do have a tribute from the state of Delaware House of Representatives. Um, tribute, be it hereby known to all uh, that the House of Representatives recognizes Dr. Adriana Leela Bohm on the occasion of her retirement from the Red Clay Consolidated School Board. She's not going anywhere though. She's now an official community member. We're gonna pull her in as much as we can. The tribute says, we recognize this outstanding individual for her many years of dedicated service to the Red Clay Consolidated School Board. For 14 years, Dr. Bohm has served as an associate professor of sociology for Delaware County Community College in Pennsylvania, where she teaches sociology with her favorite course being experiences in diversity. She has earned a PhD from Temple University in sociology a master's from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in sociology and a BA from the University of Delaware in sociology and black American studies. During her tenure, Dr. Bohm, the first female of color on the board worked hard to improve educational processes and outcomes through a policy perspective. She is continuously advocating, speaking openly and organizing against injustice. We commend Dr. Bohm's remarkable contributions for ensuring quality education to the students and bestow our best wishes for successful future endeavors. The House of Representatives extends a sincere appreciation and directs this tribute issued on the 21st day of June 2023, and it's co-sponsored by Representative Kim A. Williams, Michael Smith, Nomi Chikwocha, Sherry Dorsey Walker, Deborah Heffernan, Mike Ramon, Melissa Minor Brown, Eric Morrison, Deshaun O'Neill, 
and Stephanie T. Bolden. Congratulations, Dr. Byrne. And now we will have Senator Lockman come to the podium. Yeah. Good evening, everyone, um, especially Dr. Bohm. Um, it means more than I can say to be here tonight presenting this tribute, obviously in my official capacity, but I'm also here in very much a personal capacity um, because I wouldn't be here in an official capacity if it wasn't for my friendship. Uh, longtime friendship with Dr. Bum. I cannot believe it's been 10 years. And uh, it doesn't seem like that long ago when our children were classmates at then Highlands Elementary. Um, and I was uh, a, a mom in my like late 20s, which also seems impossible, running the PTA. And uh, of course, you came and stirred the pot at those meetings. And ever since, I think we have had so many opportunities to do that together. And I've learned so much from you and been so inspired by you, just like everyone else, I think, here and well beyond. Um, and so just uh, just amazed at what you've accomplished and that it's been 10 years and so thankful to, to you. And now I will read this tribute, which um, comes from all of us in the Delaware State Senate. Be it hereby known to all that Senators S. Elizabeth Lockman and Sarah McBride are joined by the Senate of the 152nd General Assembly in commending Adriana Lee LeBohm, PhD, recognizing her distinguished service to the Red Clay School District Board of Education. Throughout her tenure, she has tire tirelessly shared of her time and talent and has gained the respect and high regard of all who have the good fortune to know her. Dr. Bohm has served with distinction throughout her decade of dedicated service. Through her strong focus on equity initiatives, she has played a vital role in the creation of important initiatives such as the Resolution for Safe and Inclusive Schools, the creation of the Diversity Committee, the Racial Equity Initiative, and the increase in race, trauma, and LGBTQ-focused professional development for employees. The sponsors find it most befitting the Senate recognize a fine public servant. Um, the Senate directs this tribute issued Wednesday, the 21st of June, as Adriana Bohm celebrates the culmination of a job well done. Thank you so much. Here. I'm passing the baton uh, to Councilman Street. No. And Councilwoman Kirkpatrick, I wasn't sure. Um, I have a resolution here and it's sponsored by six of us. Um, Council, Councilwoman Kirkpatrick, myself, Council President Hartley Nagel, uh, Councilman Hollins, Councilman Tool, and Councilman Sheldon. And I'm not going to read it all, but it's, it says some of the things that have already been said. Um, commending Dr. Adriana Lillabaum for 10 years of dedicated service to the Red Clay Consolidated School District and recognize your background, your affiliation with the ACLU. And I'm going to go straight to the main course. Whereas the list of Dr. Bohm's commendable achievements as a board member is both extensive and diverse, including but not limited to spearheading the movement to change the inappropriate mascot at Conrad School, leading the fight to ensure diversity at Cook School, establishing the district's inaugural diversity committee, successfully championed the inclusion of student representatives on school board committees and, and the Wilmington Learning Collaborative, leading the charge to have Red Clay join the jewel vaping lawsuit in order to <coughs> safeguard student health and well being tirelessly working to provide trauma and LGBTQ focused professional development for school employees and playing a vital role on the committee that successfully secured the passage of House Bill 98, which mandates black history inclusion in school curriculum. And whereas in year 2022, Adriana Baum exhibited extraordinary leadership and successfully spearheaded the initiative to rename Highland School to Joseph E. Johnson School. <coughs> a fitting tribute to Dr. Johnson, the former superintendent of the Wilmington School District, who valiantly 
led the city of Wilmington into the era of school desegregation in 1978 and subsequently served as the Red Clay School District's inaugural, inaugural superintendent. That was critical and important to me because in my view, it made a complete circle of the primary leaders in the school desegregation era from the city. Jim Sills got his statue, Judge Williams got the courthouse, <laughs> Hicks got the Hicks Anderson Center, and <laughs> you finished it as far as I'm concerned. And for that, I'm forever grateful. And now therefore be resolved by County Council, Newcastle County Council, <laughs> The council hereby commends Dr. Adriana Lee Bone for her exceptional 10 years of dedicated service to the Red Clay Consolidated School District. It doesn't say that. But when you walk into that building, as I remember for four years and leaving in 1970, it says, enter to learn, go forward to serve. You enter to serve. Go forward, continue to serve in your own way the way you want to change the world. I certainly appreciate everything that you've done. I just really came as Jay's date tonight. <laughs> 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 I'm too, I don't want no trial. <laughs> However, my council district is the third district, and most of my council district is red clay. So, on behalf of my district, I want to thank you, Dr. Bohm, for everything that you've done for the red clay district. Thank you for serving. <laughs> Still here. Can we have another round of applause for Dr. Boehm and her 10 years of service? We're going to have some remarks from Dr. Boehm and then we'll continue with our agenda. Hi. Uh, so I did have um, a little bit of a longer speech prepared. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I wanted to say good evening, and I'd like to make a few remarks to commemorate my last official school board meeting. I believe in term limits and in passing the torch, which is why I made the decision not to run for a third term on this board. I'm super excited to pass the baton to Miss Ajay English Wynn and to see what this next era of new leadership brings. I also wanna thank my predecessor, Lee Davis, who did the same thing back in 2013. After Ms. Davis served one term, she decided not to run again. This opened the door for Senator Lachman to double down on me and convince me to run for the school board. 
When I told my parents I was interested in running, my dad said, you're not doing anything until you call J Street. And my mom said, you can't run until you talk to Ray as in Jones Avery. So I did both and here I am at the end of 10 years of service. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for loving me and for supporting me and in inspiring me and in encouraging me over the last 10 years. And I wanted to say to Ms. Maria Stevens, thank you for your strength and your fortitude and always keeping me on the right track. And I told Superintendent Green, I'm not really gonna say anything about him because he knows I love him and I'll start to cry and I don't wanna do that. But his vision is inspirational and he will keep the district running forward with this board. And I look forward to watching as that evolves. Um, and I would like to especially say thank you to Mr. J Street, who always believed in me and who always answered the phone for me over the last 10 years. I called Jay multiple times at 4.30 or 5 a.m. in about in a panic about things. And Jay was always there answering the phone, right? So I just wanted to say I love you and thank you because without you, I couldn't be here. Um, over the last decade, when I look back, I think the city role and the city seat um, and the people in our community played a vital role in creating a new type of red clay. And many of the things that we have now in 2023 weren't here in 2013. And you all mentioned a lot of them, so I'm not gonna mention um, every single thing, but I just wanted to point out a few things. In 2013, birth control was available in wellness centers in many of our districts, but not in red clay. We changed that. Um, we, we demanded trauma-informed teaching practices, restorative justice, and an end to disparate disparate discipl disciplinary practices, which we're still fighting for, but we've done a lot of work in that area. And I wanted to shout out Shannon Griffin for providing so much leadership in that endeavor. Um, we worked with educators, RCEA and D DSCA to pass the class size resolution, the full-time specials, teachers in all schools resolutions, Yes, that's a mouthful. And the opt-out policy for state mandated tests. Um, we also changed the name of the racist mascot at Conrad and had Highlands renamed after Dr. Johnson. Um, we had student representation that was demanded on the school board and we won that. We won the battle at Cook. And I remember working so deep into the night with Jay on some of the, um, the leaflets that we created to get people to become aware of the situation of people from Hocassin not wanting the children from Lancaster Court Apartments to attend Cook Elementary School because they wanted to keep it a suburban school with an elite body of students. And at that board meeting Mr. Street came to, there were probably a hundred people arguing why they didn't want the children from Lancaster Court, literally elementary school age children, they didn't want them to go to that school. Um, we worked with Network Delaware, Christian Walter specifically to write and pass the safe and inclusive schools policy, which kept ICE out of our schools. Um, we worked with NOW and students across the state to rewrite the student dress code policy. And we worked very hard with numerous groups to pass policy 8005. And I thank Jose Matthews for his vision and leadership on that endeavor. Um, we also worked with Shah Janelle, Richard Raw, and Taria Highlands and others to write the Red Clay Board Policy in support of Representative Dorsey Walker's HB 198. And we've done much more work in this district. Now, we've had a number of wins over the last decades, but I want to say that even policies which did not pass, such as the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor resolution that we bought in front of this board and lost in a five to two vote, with Jose and I being the two people to vote for it, even though we lost that vote, it was powerful to bring that resolution to the table because it sparked critical conversations on volatile topics such as school discipline, the role of law enforcement in our school, the question of what really is safety and who really is safe, and also how safety plays out for different groups. Furthermore, this resolution allowed us to discuss important data that was presented by the Coalition of 100 Black Women about Black girls' experiences in Delaware schools. So I especially wanted to thank the MWUL, um, Lynn Howard, Cheyenne Millard, Diane Miller, sorry, and all the other women, including Chandra Pitts and Tizzy Lockman, who have worked on elevating the voices of Black women and girls in Wilmington and in Delaware. That's much needed and very important. So 
thinking about the wins and even the losses, I would be remiss to say that this board has done its work. There's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done. For instance, all board committee meetings should be offered in a hybrid format. Student voices need to be incorporated more vigorously into the decision-making process. For instance, most board committees do not have student reps. This needs to be changed. Parent engagement needs to be cultivated deliberately and intentionally, and we need to center equity and the student voice in our strategic plan. We also need to tackle inequity in the admissions process at our magnet and charter schools. This issue has been brought before the board for more than 10 years, and we continue to not, we continue to ignore it. Let's just say what it is, right? We must work to change that. Um, we need to desegregate our schools because we have a system of educational redlining, which is not constitutional and it creates havoc in our educational system. And it's racist and it's classist. Um, the board should also not hobble the critical work the WLC is doing under the leadership of Reverend Perry, Mr. Patton, Ms. Alethea Smith-Tucker, and our parent educa educator and student representatives. Um, now, being on this board has helped me grow in numerous ways, both professionally and personally, and it has opened my eyes to the tremendous amount of important legislative work that is being done and that still needs to be done. For instance, we need a statewide weighted funding formula, and Mr. Street has been leading that fight for, for decades. I was gonna say years, but it's decades. Um, we need to address non-school student arrests, which were identified as a problem by Mr. Devin Henson. And I'm so glad we've started to do this work under the leadership of Representative Sherry Dorsey Walker by discussing Title 14 of the Delaware Code relating to school discipline. We need to pass Eric Morrison's HB 96, and we need to create legislation to provide free lunch to all school students across the state of Delaware, regardless of income, such as other states have done like California. Now I can go on and on, but I'll save that for my next talk. So in closing, I'd like to say we cannot be afraid to tell the story of the deficits, the failures, and the disparate outcomes that the Red Clay School Board has produced and helped maintain. It is only by facing these realities that we can reimagine and work towards less oppressive and a more equitable future for our students. So when you are the only person in the room raising your voice and they tell you to be quiet, make more noise and shout even louder. When they tell you they need more time and you're moving too fast, tell them we've been fighting for justice for too damn long. When they tell you not to get political, remind them that every law, every policy, and every rule is political because politics is literally about the public affairs of our system and that includes our educational system. So stand up, mobilize, organize, coalition build, and be brave like Naya Cruz. Thank you, Ms. Cruz. Even when it's scary and hard, continue to disrupt, resist, be loud, and challenge the status quo, and simultaneously imagine, dream, and build towards the future we want for every single one of our children. Change always comes from the bottom up. It, it never comes from the top down. So keep fighting for liberation and building towards justice. We will get there. So thank you, good night, and God bless. Now we have to have a meeting after that. Thank you, Dr. Baum. <laughs> okay, we're gonna move on with our agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda for tonight's board meeting? So moved, Kathy Thompson. Is there a second? Second, Jose Matthews. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda as submitted. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next, we'll move on to public comment. The Red Clay School Board appreciates any member of the community who would like to make public comment. According to Board Policy 2006, the Red Clay School Board allocates 30 minutes to public commentary. Each person may have up to three minutes to address the board, and this time may not be transferred to or from another speaker. The board generally does not respond directly to a speaker. The board meeting is not an appropriate forum to raise complaints or concerns about individual employees. Upon request, the superintendent shall provide the speaker with the procedure for submitting such complaints or concerns. 
The order of the speakers is listed on the screen. As you see your name, please make your way to a seat near the podium, or if you're virtual, please unmute when called to respect the time of anyone present tonight. When you speak, please state your name and organization if you're speaking on its behalf and the topic of your comment. There's a timer on the screen that will turn on when you have one minute left. It will turn yellow with 30 seconds left and flash in red when three minutes are over. I will thank you for your comments and call the next speaker. Let's begin with Nyadette Cruz. Welcome. Good evening. Um, my name is Naya Dett Cruz. I am the senior secretary at Shortledge Academy and president of the Red Clay Secretaries Association. Um, excuse me, but I was not expecting uh, to be mentioned in your comments. So thank you so much for, for what you have um, shared. On behalf of our CSA, we've worked very hard, very diligent in developing relationships with the administrators and the leadership here at Red Clay. That has culminated in a one-year contract that we hope will be signed this after or this evening. On behalf of our CSA, I wanted to express our thanks. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your support. Thank you to Red Clay's Human Resources and the team that came together at the negotiations table. A special thank you to our contract negotiations team who did a phenomenal job in what we were able to create in meeting with local NEA presidents from around the country, it was interesting to hear them murmuring about a small little local on the East Coast that managed to do something that apparently is historic. And I was like, well, that was, that was me, <laughs> that was our CSA. So although for many months I did stand here alone, once again tonight, I am not alone. We do have some of our membership here with us. Most of them should be on Zoom, but I do thank you for the opportunity and we look forward to continuing to work collaboratively with our leadership. And congratulations, Dr. Bohm. Thank you. Next, we have Amy Norton on Zoom. Please unmute. Hi. My name is Amy Norton, and I've taught high school English in this district for the past seven years. This year, I am leaving and won't be returning next year. Um, and the primary reason for that is because of how the English department has been run at the district level. While I have a lot to say about this in particular, I wanted to limit my comment strictly to what's relevant to the board, the parents, and the students that we are supposed to serve. I've been told by the two uh, English heads and other people at the district level that Red Clay is working to limit and almost eliminate literature within the English classroom because of the state's expectations for us. They have shared that um, through a professional development meeting with ELA teachers, that the state says that 70% of the student reading should be nonfiction. When I followed up at the state level, I was told both in person and in writing that this is not true. 70% of the students reading across all subject areas should be nonfiction. English classrooms are the primary place where students receive literature and should be primarily literature based. The goal of the state is not to change English classrooms, but to have other classes read more. When I shared this information with my district supervisors, I was told that we would not be changing our curriculum choices. I was told that science and social studies teachers are not trained and cannot be relied upon to teach our students to comprehend the nonfiction texts that they use within their classrooms. In my English class this year, my 10th grade students did not read a single poem or novel. They read five short stories and analyzed the play Hamilton for its historical accuracy by comparing it to primary sources. In freshman year, their only piece of literature is Romeo and Juliet. As a junior, they only read The Warmth of Other Suns and the film unit is other nonfiction stories and documentaries. As a senior, they have slightly more literature as they read Hamlet and In the Time of Butterflies. After this, they're expected to conduct a literary analysis despite not having the preparation. This number is less than even the misbegotten 30%. I was also told by a district supervisor that at the middle school level, students get one literature out of unit out of four over the course of the school year which is again, 25%, not 30%. English class is for literature. Despite what I was told by my supervisors, I believe that literacy is an interdisciplinary skill that teachers of all sorts are able to teach. 
Analyzing poems and immersing oneself in the language of novels belongs in the English classroom. I have studies as well as my correspondence with the state to produce if anybody's interested. Uh, but since my previous attempts to address this, both with my supervisors, uh, their supervisors, my building principal have gone unnoticed. I wanted to bring this here. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Lauren Christ. Please or please unmute. Hi. Um, my name is Lauren Christ. I attended um, AI High School um, and I attended the first committee to a meeting to understand AI's enrollment drop. Um, why it dropped so significantly since I graduated in 2007. I thought my background as a Title I special ed teacher might help me find ways to support the students and teachers in this community. Uh, it became immediately clear that regardless of whether the school's demographic changed due to their charter boom, choice buses, or the declining general population of school-age kids in the area, AI was a school that desperately needed resources as the majority of students now came from low-income families. With this in mind, I work to advocate for a holistic approach to building enrollment, um, urging the committee to serve its current students better using best practice approaches. I communicated with the teachers who provided student feedback about their immediate educational needs and desires for how AI could serve them. The teachers who shared also shared their own feedback aligning with students' requests for mental health resources, reading and math resources. And I was sure to relay this along with their evidence to the committee. I heard Kevin ask for similar resources at these meetings along with CTE classes that were in, of interest to their students. The committee's conclusion was that AI DuPont is eligible for Title I funds, all of which align with the current needs of the school and provide our students with resources without any need for tax increase or money from the community's pockets. The district officials decided not to use these funds at AI, however, due to optics. Instead, they concluded AI would receive construction CTE courses, an area of which there was zero interest from students. I'd like to ask both the district and the board going forward to take the feedback you've been given from both teachers, staff, families, students, and all those who are in the embodiment of the work that needs to be done and move forward accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Janine Clark. Welcome. Hello. Okay. I hope you can hear me. Um, good evening, board. My name is Janine Clark. I'm a third grade math teacher at Warner Elementary, and I come to you tonight. Oh, and I'm also the treasurer for Red Clay Education Association. Um, I come to you tonight on behalf of our president, Stephen Fackenthal. I am speaking in favor for the teacher contract action item that will be before you this evening. As part of the negotiation team, I was happy to make progress on many issues brought forward. I look forward to the intent and meaning and language being used in a positive manner for the betterment of our educators. I appreciate the good conversation that were had during those five days, five long days, by the way, <laughs> um, and look forward to future, future collaboration um, for next year. Thank you for those members who participated on the negotiation team, as well as our table team. Thank you for all the members that voted to ratify our contract. And thank you um, to the district for being open to hearing us and working collaboratively together. Thank you and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Next, we have Greg Wilson. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Greg Wilson. I'm with Friends of AI, a group of concerned AI alumni who want to see AI do well. I also want to thank Dr. Bohm for her service. Um, first, I also, uh, also want to thank uh, the Red Clay School Board for creating the task force. We found it very edifying and helpful. I want to thank uh, Superintendent Darrell Green and Mark Pruitt and his team. I think they did a great job. Um, Friends of AI, we are here to help moving forward. We want to work with the district and with new school leadership um, and all uh, to improve all the comprehensive high schools uh, to be the best that they can be. Um, for those of us who participated in the task force, aside from learning a lot, we learned patience. Trying to change a school takes time. 
trying to uh, get an understanding of all the complex issues takes time. Um, but most of all, the number one thing that we want to highlight is, is numbers matter and context matters. Numbers may tell a story, but not the full story. If you look at AI, it has an 80% graduation rate, uh, but only 24% are at a proficiency measured by the SAT, and only 8% at a proficiency in math. That's on the, the, the Delaware report card. That's a public facing document. And our argument as uh, friends of AI is that we wanna see Red Clay School District be a leader in addressing the uh, biases within the SAT. We don't think it's an adequate measure. We don't think it's a good measure of student improvement. There can be uh, miss or messages sent out to the general public that don't adequately reflect the quality of teaching at AI or the students. So that's one of our, our major asks is try to find some other way to measure student achievement than the SAT scores. A lot of students don't even care when they take it because they're not going to college. They just zip through it, they get a zero and that lowers the average. So we seriously ask the district to consider being a leader in addressing SATs being part of that, that, uh, that, that dashboard. Um, the other issue that we are raised, have raised earlier and we raised in the past is the issue of Title I funding. We understand that AI qualifies for Title I funding, but due to tough choices in the past and the decisions that the district has to make now, those numbers aren't going to be forthcoming. Those funds aren't going to be forthcoming. We urgently ask the district to consider, con consider all opportunities to get additional resources into that school because they need emotional or behavioral specialists, reading specialists, and an outreach officer in particular to reach out to the community. Um, the low-income students that go to AI, are uh, their, their challenges are shared by students that also attend Dickinson and McCain. Um, due to the decisions made 15 years ago, Red Clay's created three low-income high schools and they, they can't get Title I funding just due to the, the challenges that we all face. We recognize that, but we look forward to working with you in the future. We wanna find solutions to the challenges facing AI and the other comprehensive schools, and we appreciate all that you've done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Mike Matthews. Welcome. Good evening. Um, Mike Matthews, teacher here at Cab Calloway. Um, I can count on maybe two hands the number of people for whom I can remember the specific time and specific place where I met them. People like my husband or my best friend, Jackie, or even President Biden, who I met a few times. And then there's a Dr. Adriana Bohm. It was February 2012 at Shortledge Academy at an informational session on the upcoming capital referendum. Dr. Bohm was grilling Dr. Brumall and Dr. Darty, particularly about the plans to build a new elementary school in the suburbs when she felt our city students deserved better learning conditions. She didn't let up with her questions, backing up her information with data and statistics and demanding the district do a better job for the kids in Wilmington. At one point, I believe I may have tried to tone police her to or invoke some generic white BS about what MLK would want us to do, or maybe some kumbaya, can't we all just get in along in an attempt to calm her down? But I learned that night, and I've been learning from Adriana ever since. Our paths soon crossed again that summer, and we began to meet more regularly. At one point, I popped the question and asked Adriana if she would consider running for an open board seat. Believe it or not, she did take a good deal of convincing, but I had become so ensnared in her infectious combination of institutional knowledge of our state school system and her commitment to direct action that I knew we'd have a great advocate for kids and educators on the board. The campaign was a whirlwind. She knocked on doors, she made phone calls, she raised money, she, she cried a bit and I was, I was there for her and she won. And the gifts she's given to our district, the education she's given us, we're going to reap those benefits for our students in the community for decades to come. Let's not mince words about the critical work Adriana has initiated in this district. She has forced this board to have challenging and unflinching conversations on the topics of race and the harm that systemic and deeply rooted institutionalized racism has done to our schools. She righteously fought back against disturbing personal attacks and smears as she sought to end the use of a racist mascot at one of our schools. She demanded the district and state be held accountable for the de facto resegregation of our schools over the last 20 years. She's fought to hold individuals accountable who failed to properly alert our communities about lead in the water. And she stood up loudly and declared unwaveringly that Black Lives Matter 
trans lives matter and white silence is complicity in the fight for liberty and justice for all. And even better than her positions on these critical issues, she backed them all up with policy proposals, resolutions, and calls for direct action from the seven members of this school board. And while member, many of her initiatives may not have passed this board because history tells us that progress is slow, so many of us in the community recognize and thank Adriana for her work. On a personal note, Adriana, it's going to be very hard for me to see you go. We will never see a board member of your like. I love you, my friend, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. Thank you. Is, when it, is it on? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> we have to fix our mic. Okay. We'll move on. They're all off. I hear yours. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're moving on. To approval of minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the executive session from May 10th, 2003? So moved, Kathy Thompson. Is there a second? Second, Martin Wilson. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed? Motion carries. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the regular session on May 10th, 2023? So moved, Kathy Thompson. Is there a second? Second, Jose Matthews. All, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the special executive session held on May 16th, 2023? So moved, Kathy Thompson. Is there a second? Second, Jose Matthews. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. At this time, we will have the, hear from our superintendent, Mr. Green, with it, where he will share his superintendent's report. And so before I begin my report, I do want to thank and acknowledge the work of Dr. Bohm. Um, again, as she indicated, uh, she, she definitely pushes the needle, um, and, and it's all for good. It's for the good of our children. So thank you for the decade of service that you've provided Red Clay. Thank you for the support that you've given me as a superintendent of Red Clay. Um, as we indicated, and as we've discussed, I know you'll continue to be active in the community and support our efforts here. So thank you for, again, the 10 years of service and all that you've done for the students and families throughout the Red Clay and the state for that matter. So we greatly appreciate your service. And just with my report, the cover page, um, this has been the marathon season of, of ceremonies. Uh, I can honestly say it's the, the most rewarding part of my job, but also the most tiresome part of the job. Um, I do wanna acknowledge our communications department who and district staff who've been there every step of the way as we've acknowledged and celebrated our graduates, those who have moved up, those who have transitioned, the many activities that we've had um, throughout the end of May, um, but more importantly, through the first part of, of, of June. Now, my cover picture is actually one of the first. Um, and as we talk about, you know, obviously there are a lot of needs within the district. There's a lot for us to celebrate as a district. Um, and this is the AI High um, A team, which is the eSports team. Um, I actually just got contacted by the Delaware Department of Education last week um, because we have the model program. Um, and for those that don't know, eSports, um, is quote unquote gaming, but it's not gaming. There's a whole industry um, that, that supports esports. Uh, many colleges, albeit it's not a NCAA sanctioned sport, are getting involved, um, propping up esports and gaming labs. Um, but AI High School participated in a five school um, challenge throughout the state. They are the inaugural 2023 spring champions. And again, esports is competitive gaming that brings together scholastics and academics around social emotional learning, digital citizenship, and connections to core content areas, specifically STEM. So they do everything from game design, um, broadcasting, uh, digital content creation. Um, and there are also opportunities with our partnerships with Future First Gaming and Wilmington University to really look and take AI in particular to, to a, a cyber tech high school. And so I'm, I'm claiming that here and stating that, that we're gonna leverage this as an opportunity um, to not only grow the current programming along with the AI task force, um, but celebrate a lot of the good quality work that's actually taking place there. So congratulations to um, AI High School for their being the inaugural champs. And we're looking forward to DOE actually patterning a lot of what we're doing across the state. 
Um, we had uh, our graduates um, that were celebrated. It's actually started with our Meadowood graduation at McCain High School and concluded actually here in the Cab Theater with the Groves commencement ceremony. Um, I know Mr. Matthews, it was a full circle moment. Um, you know, he had family member participate in that, that ceremony as well. Um, Red Clay, the class of 22, 2023, excuse me, was offered more than $22 million in scholarship funds um, this year. So congratulations again to all of our graduates. Thank you to our graduation coordinators, our school administration, school counselors, uh, support staff. Um, again, it was an all hands on deck effort. I think all in all, I participated and spoke at nine commencement ceremonies. Um, so it's again, it's just not our traditional high schools that are graduating. We have our Grows Adult Ed program, Project Search. The only school that didn't actually have a commencement ceremony or graduation ceremony this year was our first state school. Uh, but we're looking forward to obviously continuing celebrating them. You can find photos and pictures of all of our commencement ceremonies. Um, they can be viewed at facebook.com backslash red clay schools. So again, we posted all of those various ceremonies. Uh, feel free to, again to look at those celebratory moments that were captured on our Facebook page. The district also recognized and celebrated our Employee Support Professional of the Year, uh, Mr. Neil Patel. So congratulations to, to Neil. Uh, for those that probably have never um, had the opportunity to actually see Neil's face, you probably knew the name. Um, so Neil is one of those individuals behind the scenes, no matter how big or how small of a tech issue you would have, he was always there to support with customer service, professionalism, and he embodies, I think, what we all aspire to be um, in terms of red clay around a customer service oriented mindset. So we're excited to recognize and celebrate outstanding, his outstanding service in our district. After more than 400 nominations, we are proud again to introduce the recipient of this year's uh, District Educational Support Professional of the Year, Mr. Neil Patel. So congratulations to Neil. As we continue to look at our Grow Your Own initiative, um, whether that would be with our educators, we also had the opportunity to look at the Red Clay Aspiring Leadership Academy. We wrapped up on June 8th after a year-long professional growth opportunity for Red Clay staff who aspire to become leaders. The whole cohort was made up of 12 Red Clay teachers, student advisors from across the district. Um, again, this is an opportunity to really look at Grow Your Own. Um, thank you to uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Abernathy from AI DuPont, Kimberly DeJean from Dickinson, Kathy Gormley from Brandywine Springs, uh, Francis Greger from Conrad, Jada Harris from Warner, Elizabeth McClinton, McClinton from Skyline, uh, Alec Malachek from Meadowood, Christopher Raspoli from HB DuPont, Kelly Ryan from Linden Hill, Christopher Seguiz from Cook, Trevor Steele from Moat, and then we had Gina Travellini Rubini from Dickinson. Thank you to those 12 members who participated. And if I butchered your name, um, charge it to my mind and not my heart. Um, but again, this is an opportunity. I also want to thank Dr. Aaron DeCastro, Mr. Mark Pruitt, um, and others who supported that program all year in addition to their other responsibilities. Um, but this is an opportunity for us to develop a pipeline um, of aspiring leaders within the district. So thank you to those members and to the leadership for supporting that program. We also last week had the opportunity um, to honor our 55 retirees who completed over 1200 plus years of service um, to the Red Clay staff and families. Thank you to those retirees who were able to join us and their family members, but then more importantly, thank you to um, all of our retirees. Thank you to the board members who were in attendance, uh, Mr. Matthews, Mr. Casper, and um, Ms. Thompson. Thank you to the HR department uh, under the leadership of Lauren Fleck for their due diligence and really honoring and supporting our retirees. And that's just not with certificates and the acknowledgement, but also helping them with their retirement plans. We know that can be a scary process. So thank you to uh, those in the HR office who work hand in hand with our retirees and guiding them through that process of making sure they have all their ducks in a row, credible years of service and such um, to earn the fruits of their labor. So to our Red Clay retirees, the 55 men and women who are graduating and going on to have um, that forever coffee break <laughs> or every day being a weekend, um, so much uh, success to each and every one of you. And again, thank you for the years of service that you provided the student, staff, and families here in Red Clay. Uh, 
We also want to acknowledge uh, Ms. Erica Veritas, fifth grade teacher at Cook Elementary, who received the Governor's Awards in Excellence um, in Civics Education. Um, she was also the Cook's 2023-2024 Teacher of the Year. Um, so again, a fitting moment um, for not only Ms. Veritas, but the work that's happening over at Cook. And th thank you to the Governor for um, taking time um, to award uh, Ms. Veritas uh, with the Governor's Award in Excellence. And Principal Jacobs was surprised that during that convening, the governor actually knew um, Cook's reading data and was impressed to see that again, not only are we growing students um, across the district, but we're also growing our high achieving students, which is just as much a challenge as you look to grow other students. So he spoke to that data. Um, and again, thank you to the wonderful work that's happening, not only across the district, but at Cook. We also have Red Clay World Champions. We had two Odyssey of the Mind teams um, placed in the district. So we want to give a shout out to North Star Elementary for being first place in Division One, uh, Problem One, Pirates and Treasures. So they are the number one ranked team in the world. And that, that's a huge accomplishment to bring home the Red Clay. So congratulations to Cook, I mean to uh, excuse me, North Star, and then also HB DuPont Middle School um, placed fifth in Division Two, Problem Two, which was because I can and they place fifth in the world. So two huge accomplishments for two red clay schools. Let's give it up for both uh, North Star and HB. And just for those that um, wanna also give a shout out to Heritage Elementary who placed fifth in the state of Delaware at the other elementary team too, again. So lots of wonderful things. Odyssey of Mine has been in, in exception for 43 years. Um, there have been uh, only one other team in many years ago to achieve this milestone of being the number one uh, team. So again, th this is a huge banner, not only for Red Clay, but for the state of Delaware, when you can bring the number one world team um, back to our state. As we talk about celebratory moments, um, you know, again, both bittersweet. Uh, we wanna thank our Warner and the community at large for coming out, supporting us on Saturday. Uh, for the Red Clay Rides for Newt uh, in honor of um, the fallen and late great Dr. Terrence Newton. Uh, we had more than 70 riders participate in a ride from Warner Elementary, um, and this was a motorcycle and classic car ride. We had about, again, 70 motorcycles and one slingshot to, to Mr. Simmons up there who, who drives a, it's a, a unique vehicle that you may see on the road. Um, but donations will benefit unique programs at Warner. Again, we rode from Warner Elementary to Delaware State uh, University. So again, thank you to all of those who came out. I wanna give a huge shout out to Mr. Jeffrey Knott, who is the president of the custodial um, union. Uh, Mr. Knott and I had a conversation being, uh, you know, fellow motorcyclists um, not too long after Dr. Newton's passing. And Mr. Knott had the vision of actually sponsoring this charity ride. And so that came from, you know, someone who knew of Dr. Newton, um, knew of his impact, but obviously felt and shared in the loss that we all uh, continue to endure. Um, and working with uh, Ms. Mobley, our chief communications office, um, you know, we put together this ride, not anticipating, you know, when we had six pre-registrants and having more than 70 motorcycles show up on a Saturday, which was a beautiful day um, to, to honor Dr. Newton, but more importantly, to support uh, Warner Elementary and his legacy. Also want to thank the Red Clay Education Foundation um, for the annual golf tournament um, at the Newark Country Club. Again, another historical moment. This was the largest event in Newark Country Club's history. So again, um, Red Clay had over 120 golfers. It was actually oversold. Uh, a Huge shout out to Mr. Bill Allen and Kim Allen, but in particular, Mr. Bill Allen um, for orchestrating, um, leading, um, along with other Red Clay Foundation members. Um, so thank you to all of those members who donated their time, energy, and effort. Um, thank you to the various teams, um, our <coughs> partnerships, CyberLink Train Energy Services, Nemoore Children's Hospital, White and Turner, Delmarva Power, Young Conway, um, Kathy Thompson Family Fund, uh, Mr. Dave Vole, um, Peggy Valvola, Friend of the Family Incorporated, Preferred Electric, Sutton Bus Company, Back to Basics, um, Shellyson's Electric, Electrical, ID Griffith, Lexus Nexus, First Choice, Auto and Truck Repair, and Champion Trophies. 
In addition to Brandywine Springs, North Star, Richardson Park, Ritchie, Stanton had two teams, H.B. DuPont Middle, Cab Calloway, A.I. DuPont High School, who actually were the champions. Um, they were the, the winning team, and it was a foursome. Uh, we had EYP admin participating. Linden Hill had a team, and we had two district teams um, totaling 120 golfers. We raised over $10,000 for McKinney Vento programming. Uh, for those that don't know, the foundation has allocated additional $10,000 a year uh, to support the work um, of Mr. Michael Simmons and April Anderson, who oversee our McKinney Vento families. McKinney Vento was a federally funded program to support students and families who are experiencing homelessness. But we know with those federal dollars comes restrictions. So the foundation has kind of filled that gap where families may have to pay utility bills. Um, they may have needs for cars or, you know, while you may get secure housing, you still have bed linens and things that you need to secure. So the foundation has stepped up over the past three years. And now this will be the fourth year where they've allocated an additional $10,000. So this money is well spent. Um, there is a call for additional help, whether that would be um, foundation members. So if you want to learn more about the foundation or join, um, feel free to reach out to my office. Again, um, thank you to our communications department. Um, we did honor and, and recognize Juneteenth as well at this particular event um, for all their hard work and effort, again, putting red clay in a, in a positive spotlight. Our professional learning end of the year conference. Um, I wanna thank all of our educators for their engagement. Um, I wanna thank our teaching and learning department um, in particular, um, those who help orchestrate and, and, and put the event on. Again, it's, it's always challenging to try to have professional learning at the end of the year. Um, we know that folks have put in their time, they put in their energy, they put in their effort, but our staff were engaged. Um, and just two um, actually quotes or thank yous that, that came back from um, our educators. One said, I just want to reach out to say thank you so much for all of the hard work and planning that went into yesterday's professional development. You and your team meticulously planned and seamlessly executed an entire event, the organization, attention to detail and thoughtfulness and um, curtailing the sessions um, were evident at every step and the topics were also relevant, engaging and important to our practice. From the moment I arrived until the final session, I felt welcome, supported and motivated to make the most out of the experience. The speakers and facilitators were exceptional as well. Each presenter brought a unique perspective and expertise that enriched my understanding and gave me a great, great tools to utilize in my classroom, which I already can't wait to implement next school year. Another quote was, thank you again for the powerful wrap up to the school year. I wish you all a rest, restful and relaxing summer. The next one is, I hope you had a restful um, evening after your hard work um, of informed presenters of the district PD. Um, this was the best district PD I ever attended. I would love if this were the model um, that we do for all of the PDs from now on. I learned so much and came out of each session excited to implement it in my classroom. And so this is an opportunity, again, for us to continue to work to collaborate, as you heard um, from leaders within our respective employee groups. We're going to continue to work hard and diligent and make sure that we have those strong collaborative relationships with all of our employees. Um, while most would typically look at it as adversarial relationships, when you look at management and, and, and staff, we don't see it that way. Their members are our employees, so we will continue to do our diligence to make sure that those relationships are strong. So again, thank you to everyone in the teaching learning department for all of their hard work and effort and making sure that the school year wrapped up um, on a strong note. Red Clay also represented today at the 21st Annual Policy and Practice Institute. Um, we had many of our very own present today. Uh, Dr. Natalie Ortega Moran, principal at William um, C. Lewis Dual Language Immersion Program, was a part of engaging all stakeholders in data chats and goal setting. And for those that don't know, the Annual Policy and Practice Institute is a statewide professional development opportunity. Again, so Dr. Um, Ortega Moran was a presenter. Uh, her session focused on how leaders can use data and support teachers and students in engaging in those data conversations and data charts to drive teaching and learning forward. So thank you to Dr. Uh, Ortega Moran. We also had um, Dr. Donye Woods. She participated and actually facilitated a workshop on their connection and community. 
Um, her session was focused on as schools face many challenges in operating as community hubs post COVID, positive education outcomes can be achieved through a synergistic work of schools, families, and communities. Uh, during her session, participants had the opportunity to analyze operational strategies, explore ways to extend and strengthen family, school, and community connections to increase school and district partnerships and influence student achievement outcomes. Uh, Roberta Jacobs, principal at Cook, uh, had a session called Getting Booked on One School, One Book Initiative. And it was really focused on, again, galvanizing the school and families and a shared reading experience. Uh, one School, One Book is a school-wide opportunity for every student and staff member to read the same book at the same time. Uh, the session is designed to introduce the idea of One School, One Book. And again, thank you to uh, Ms. Jacobs for doing that. We also had our very own uh, Dr. Stephanie Armstrong participate in an effective recruitment, and she's not pictured here, uh, recruitment and retention strategies for disrupting low educator diversity. Um, that was focused on really looking at a panel discussion about strategies um, that districts and LEAs are using to impact recruitment and retention. And again, Dr. Armstrong works with our teacher residents and, um, and, and novice teachers. So thank you to her for, again, taking time out of her day to represent Red Clay on the state level. And then in conclusion, Dr. Bond and Dr. Dorsey um, led a work on racial affinity groups how two districts uh, partnered to create safe spaces for educators. And when we talk about, you know, not only representation, but feeling like you belong within a part of an organization, our affinity groups have taken off. Um, we're, we're proud about that work. And they, again, presented on a state level uh, in the standing room only. Um, and I know a lot of districts were looking to try to pattern themselves out of the work that was taking place here in Red Clay. And then um, we just wanted to share that you know, thank you to our community members, um, educator leaders, uh, board members, stakeholder groups who participated um, in the Wilmington Learning Collaborative meet and greet and town hall meeting, which we hosted at Warner uh, last week on June 13th. Um, the Wilmington Learning Collaborative Council uh, unanimously voted to recommend Dr. Laura Burgos as the executive director uh, for the Wilmington Learning Collaborative. Um, Again, unanimously approved. Um, Dr. Burgos brings a lot of experience. Um, and for all intents and purposes, the feedback that I've heard from our stakeholders, uh, folks feel like her leadership is one that will be supportive of the work that we're currently doing um, here in Red Clay and enhance the opportunities that the state is providing us to advance and move that work forward. Um, so, you know, welcome to Dr. Burgos. Um, but more importantly, we're excited about the opportunity to actually showcase when we hosted the Wilmington Learning Collaborative meeting um, at Warner um, prior to the town hall. I know many of the fellow council members who serve in other districts were um, one impressed by the way that the physical building looked um, first and foremost, because a safe, clean environment is, is foundational to learning. Um, but more importantly, when they learn um, from principal, um, Broynton Price. Um, now I, I got I got to learn that Price Broynton, um, recently married, but she um, shared data, and I know one board uh, council member in particular, uh, Mr. Donald Patton, wanted to learn more, and once he learned and and and, and witnessed and observed the growth of the students in Warner, and I know we heard from Mr. Janine Clark, who's third grade math teacher at Warner you know, really serving as a model from the dental clinic to the wellness center to all of the things that are happening in that particular school. Um, we, we definitely have a strong foundation from which I think we can help our neighboring districts um, grow and thrive. And then more importantly, look at the work, not only at Warner, but it's happening at Shortledge, um, Dr. Johnson, um, Lewis, respectively. Um, you know, not that we don't have our challenges and work to be done, um, but some exciting things are happening and some things, exciting things yet to come. So again, thank you to all of those members from the community who came out to participate in both the meet and greet and town hall. And then in closing, we're, we're kicking off summer programs. I know a lot of that started uh, today. Um, so thank you to all of our educators, to all of our school leaders, to everyone who's rolling up their sleeves, um, who are taking that break to continue to invest in our students um, as we look at learning acceleration, learning recovery, enrichment opportunities across the district. Again, if you have any questions regarding Red Clay Summer Enrichment Programs, 
uh, feel free to contact our Office of Equity and Strategic Partnerships at 302-552-3751. Madam President, members of the board, that concludes my superintendent report. Thank you. Board members, do you have any questions for Superintendent Green or comments? Hearing none, we'll move on. Next, we move on to action items. Action item A, school board meeting, calendar, and locations. Uh, it is a recommendation that the Rec Lake Board of Education approve the school board meetings, calendar, and locations for the 2023-2024 school year as submitted. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation? So moved, Kathy Thompson. Is there a second? Dr. Brown. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Excuse me, uh, Dr. Uh, Neesmith, before you start the next thing, I know it's regarding the teacher contract. I just wanted to state that the PIC, the Public Integrity Commission, has ruled that those of us who have a, a, a relative that is employed by the district need to recuse ourselves from the conversation. So I do have a daughter that works in the district, so I know I need to recuse, and I will be stepping out. Okay? Thank you. Madam President, just for the public who aren't in the room, who may have saw two other board members leave with Ms. Thompson, they're also recusing themselves based on a similar pick ruling. Yes, thank you. Next action item. Action item B. So it is the recommendation that the Red Clay Board of Education approve the teacher's contract effectively September 1, 2023 through August 31st, 2026 as submitted. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation? So move, Martin Wilson. Is there a second? Dr. Bohm. Any discussion? Ms. Stevens, please call the vote. Dr. Bohm? Yes. Mr. Casper? Yes. Mr. Leonard has recused himself. Mr. Matthews has recused himself. Ms. Thompson has recused herself. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Dr. Neesmith? Yes. It's a quorum of four motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And again, Madam President, thank you to um, the leadership within RCEA, um, both negotiating teams at the district for presenting something that the board has now approved and that we've all agreed to and look forward to continuing to work with them in the future. Thank you. Action item C, it is the recommendation that the Red Clay Board of Education approve the secretarial contract as submitted. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation? So, so move, Martin Wilson. Is there a second? Dr. Bohm. Is there any discussion? Ms. Stevens, please call the vote. Dr. Bohm? Yes. Mr. Casper? Yes. Mr. Matthews? Yes. Mr. Leonard? Yes. Mrs. Thompson? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Dr. Neesmith? Yes. Unanimous motion carries. Congratulations again. Thank you again as Ms. Cruz came up. Um, thank you to the members of the Secretary Association and their leadership. Thank you to our negotiating team. Um, as well, again, another collaborative approach, and we look forward to continuing that collaboration moving forward. Action item D, donation to the early years program. It is a recommendation that the Red Clay Board of Education approve the donation in the amount of $1,500 from First State Tattoo to the early years program to be used for enrichment programs throughout the school year. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation? So moved, Kathy Thompson. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? A huge thank you to First State Tattoo. I echo that. And I know that's a unique, um, just from context, um, during Autism Awareness Month, anyone that went in to get a tattoo that represented autism awareness, those contributions went back to the EYP program. So thank you to the owners who are Red Clay parents um, for not only their generosity, but bringing about 
permanently autism awareness on a lot of folks within our community. So thank you to First State Tattoo. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Action item eight is a recommendation that the Red Clay Board of Education approve the revised student and family handbook and formally code of conduct as submitted. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation? So moved, Kathy Thompson. Second, Nick Leonard. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Action item F, board policies under review. It is a recommendation that the Red Clay Board of Education approve the following revised policies as submitted. Policy 5002, 5005, 5006, 5010, 5011, 5012, and 8024. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation? So moved, Kathy Thompson. Is there a second? Second, Vivian Matthews. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And then action item G, it is the recommendation that the Red Clay Board of Education approve all board PowerPoint presentations be added to committee reports and board docs. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second, Jose Matthews. Is there any discussion? This is just the PowerPoints. It's not the minutes, right? Is that what you mean? Yes, yes my recommendation was yeah. for the PowerPoints that were already created just to be uploaded. The content. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Next, we'll move on to action consent items. Does anything need to be removed from the consent items before we move? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved, Kathy Thompson. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Wilson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Next, we'll move on to school board committee reports. We'll begin with the AI School Exploratory Development Committee. Meeting was held on June 6th. Who would like to give the report? I'll do that. Mr. Leonard. <clears throat> so we met uh, on June 6th at AI High School, uh, led by Mark Pruitt. Uh, uh, Mr. Pruitt and the team reviewed the board change or charge of the task force and some action items and goals of the task force as voted upon by the committee, including esports curriculum development, CTE programs, dual enrollment programs with Dell Tech towards the construction pathway, the Goldie Beacom Early College Academy, rebranding of AI High School, increasing student enrollment to 800 or greater, and to re-examine the high school attendance zones in the district. Mr. Michael Simmons and his staff gave an in-depth uh, presentation on Title I funding in Red K, which included 6.2 million total and 4.2 going to dist in school districts and approximately 2 million used for other areas like homeless students, family engagement, and out of district student programs covered under Title I. I would like to thank Mr. Simmons and his staff for presenting such an in depth program. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming in and doing that. The IA Task Force has requested that the board approve the re examining of the high school attendance zones, which have not been reviewed in over two decades. It is my understanding that to begin this process, we must first seek the approval of the school board. Uh, because there are no board policies or procedures that address attendance zone evaluations, I would like to suggest that the board and district administration define procedures required to accomplish this task. Once these steps are outlined, they should be incorporated into policy for future reference and attendance zone reassessments. I would then like to use, like to see a policy developed that states the attendance zones be reviewed at least every 10 years to ensure a fair and equitable alignment of these zones and students. I want to thank uh, Mr. Mark Pruitt for organizing the AI Task Force Committee and for facilitating the meetings with robust and honest discussion on issues concerning AI high school and helping in the development of ideas and suggestions to enhance the lives of students, families, and educators at AI. With our first year behind us, we must now monitor the implementation of these programs and classes and other resources identified through the task force's efforts to assess their effectiveness. 
We need an AI task force look forward to assisting incoming leadership at AI High by helping to secure identified resources and assistance needed to move forward with the goals set forth by the task force. Thank you to all the AI task force members for dedicated service toward a final goal of success. Thank you. Any other reports? Yes, I have my report is written and it's attached in board docs. Thank you. Any questions? Moving on to board policy review committee, which was held on May 24. We'd like to give the report. Okay, hearing nothing, we'll move on. The next we have the Community Financial Review Committee. Uh, the meeting was held on June 13th. Ms. Thompson has uploaded her report. Would you like to? Right, I have a written report in board docs, but fundamentally Dr. Neesmith and I attended the meeting and we approved the minutes from the May, May 9th meeting. Dr. Celestin, the Director of Student Services gave an excellent presentation on the student services. She gave a student services update with a focus on funding and costs involved. Student services overall have increased significantly in red clay over the years. And now in addition to the typical special ed services include MTSS, social and emotional behavioral support. So um, there's uh, the, her report, her PowerPoint is in here as well. It's outstanding. It's really worth looking at. It shows the rise in student services the resources that are involved. But for us, I think the big issue is that eligibility for 504 plans has significantly broadened, resulting in an increase of such plans over the last six years from 594 students to 746. And that is not funded by anybody. They, they have no funding tied to it. And special education IEP eligibility in red clay has also been broadened by the state with a resulting increase in IEPs over the past five years from 29, from 2,921 to 3,517. So we've had a significant increase. And so there's continued increase increases in those areas. We're identifying more students, which is wonderful, but there's services that go along with it. And some has funding tied to it and some does not. The committee, again, um, and so I would, I would urge everybody to look at Dr. Sellison's PowerPoint because it's very helpful. Um, fundamentally, we, we again openly and transparently discussed our expenditure report in detail. As of the end of May, we're about 90% through the school year. Revenue is at 94.84%. Our local revenue is over 100%, which is fantastic, with expenditures at 89.2%, so we're in a good place. Uh, we, the committee continues to discuss any expenditures that were above last year or above like a certain mark, like a 90% mark. All are on the radar, fully understood and uh, being dealt with. Our next meeting is July 11th, 2023 at 6 p.m. in a hybrid mode in the district office and on Zoom. We will be reviewing the preliminary budget to determine the tax warrant, which will be sent to the board the next day. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. And just to add to that, um, the IEP numbers, I know that that is a trend across all states. So um, I'll be interested to know more research on that and what's happening. Um, it might be because of COVID, it might be just because of more awareness around um, services for students, but it's certainly an interesting number. Thank you. Any questions? Moving on to the next committee meeting, uh, Curriculum and Student Achievement Committee was held on May 17th. Who would like to give the report? I can do that. Thank you, Mr. Wigan. First, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Sam Golder for his leadership with the CSA Committee and for creating a forum of honest and accurate data and program review for all stakeholders within the district. And I'm sorry he's not here to thank him in person, but uh, as you know, he has moved on to uh, I guess greener pastures. I don't know what could be greener than red clay. <laughs> uh, the Curriculum Student Achievement Committee met on May 17th. And these are some of the highlights from that meeting. Uh, Mr. Pruitt described uh, some aspects of the partnership with Goldie Beacon College and the Red Clay School District, which uh, seems very inviting. Uh, the Early College Academy will be a forum between McCain and AI High School students where they can earn up to 30 credit hours uh, at Goldie. Courses will be offered at the schools themselves and at Goldie Beacom with shuttles uh, transporting students to and from uh, Goldie Beacom College on alternating A and B days. After completing the ECA program, students can enter Goldie Beacom as sophomores. 
And the ideal cohort size, according to uh, Mr. Pruitt, would be 24 students. There was a short discussion on SAT testing as a metric for high schools. Everyone agreed that SATs are not a good indicator of student achievement for several reasons. Uh, one, Delaware is only one of 16 states that chose to use SAT scores as an indicator of student achievement in high schools. So the majority of the country does not even use SAT as an indicator. Another is many students uh, do not take the test seriously, complete each section in just a few minutes. And I can attest to that being a proctor in many of those sessions. Uh, participation is a key and uh, results are based on 100% participation rate. The district goal for participation uh, for these uh, state choir testing is 95%. Current participation rates for some of our district schools are AI high and 89% participation. Dixon, 88%, McCain, 86%, Cab Calloway had a 99%, and Conrad, 99% participation rate. Those students not taking the SAT are counted as a zero, and the overall SAT test scores reported on DOE school report card. Uh, many colleges and universities do not use SAT scores as a requirement for enrollment. And this year's SAT and Smarter Balance scores were not available until they were released from DOE. And they haven't released them yet, have they? Uh, once they uh, come out of embargo, usually June or July, from what I understand. The good news is the state is considering another method of testing that involves a growth model and different skill levels at each student. And the SATs for 2023-24 will, will be electronic, which will significantly uh, reduce the possibility of cheating. And there will be no writing assessment. And then uh, administrators conducted 4,788 walkthroughs of classrooms. And it was found that 83% of teachers were using grade level materials. And that, that's a pretty high rate, I would think. 80%, 82% of classrooms were on pace with lessons within five days. And administrators documented 7,485 individual social emotional learning practices. So I, I think these are great achievements. And uh, Ms. Kelly Harkin, the supervisor of elementary ELA, gave an amazing presentation on the science of reading. Uh, I had my full attention. She presented documentation of how children learn to learn and how each child processes information. Uh, process information differently. Ms. Harkin showed how the different areas of the brain affect learning. It was a very enlightening presentation. Ms. Keisha Beard, supervisor of secondary LA, stated that the uh, desired outcome throughout the district is to have HQIM, high quality instructional materials in every classroom. She also introduced new district ELA programs, Odell for high schools, and American Reading Company for middle schools. Next meeting will be determined. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Okay. We did not have a diversity committee meeting or, or dropout prevention committee meeting. The next meeting was a facilities committee held on June 5th. Who would like to give the report? We'll give a little update. Uh, we have a lot of things going on in Red Clay this summer uh, with minor cap monies. Mm -hmm. Of course, we got painting going on in AI High School. We have uh, some blacktop work going on. Uh, we also have, y'all got to excuse me today. <laughs> and he, you uploaded the report too, yeah. so it's there for us. Yeah, I, I can't. It's a little hard. It's a little hard. Yeah, read it for me. Thank you. So I'll just, so I'll just highlight some things. Um, March and reviewed last year's ESCO quarterly report as it compares to this year. The savings realized were over 170,000 greater due mostly to lifted COVID restrictions. The upcoming ESCO 2 was reviewed as well. March and went over the potential of red clay qualifying for up to $4 million in grants for the $15 million anticipated project. March and shared the current anticipated summer re renovation plans for the district. There are over 45 projects planned district-wide, ranging from 
AI High School, Heritage and Ritchie parking lot replacements, Warner, Ritchie and AI High School building wide repainting, flooring projects, both VCT and hardwood, bathroom renovations and nurses and wellness suite retrofits. I think there's also a roof project going on at HP because yes. that's right near me. Yep. So I've seen the roofing packets there. Round two of the ESSER projects are underway. Some projects are delayed to next summer due to manufacturing delays. The, red, the lead water abatement is ongoing and anticipated to be complete and retested before students return to school. An update was provided on the district's plan to resubmit its major cap certificate of necessity. The original sub submission was for $200 million. However, with escalation, the current submission will be for approximately $288 million. Thank you. Any questions? All right, moving on to the next report. Red Clay Education Foundation meeting was held on June 13th. It was all focused on the uh, golf outing, and I would agree with Mr. Green. A huge shout out to um, to the Allens, especially Mr. Bill Allen and and Miss Kim Allen, they, Dr. Kim Allen. They put on a wonderful tournament. There were a lot of there was a lot of participation. And the Red Clay Education Foundation does fantastic work that we could otherwise not do. Thank you. Next was a safety and security committee meeting held on May 31st. Who would like to give the report? So the safety um, committee met to really look at school safety. We looked at end of the year. We did share some information that was um, highlighted in the report regarding um, student and school supports. Um, talked about a lot of the numbers, a lot of the increase in behaviors that we're seeing, um, types of behaviors, looked at the um, MTSS program in terms of our multi-tier systems of support frameworks around tier one, tier two, a lot of robust conversation in terms of really looking at community engagement and how we're engaging the community um, around student behaviors. And then we spoke specifically about um, safety improvement around schools where we knew we had higher rates of high frequencies of um, set behaviors, um, you know, Stanton, Skyline, um, a lot of our schools where we know they also may need more community-based supports and how we're working collaboratively with our district, working with partners within um, the safety committee. Um, we didn't have full attendance. Obviously, it was at the end of the month, um, but a lot of those partner organizations and agencies are already involved um, in our schools, i.e. the Center for Structural Equity, for example, has programs stood up in our school working with Mr. Darrell Chambers. Um, we were waiting on our school climate data, which was to also help inform a lot of that work. Uh, the University of Delaware, unfortunately, their database didn't allow us to have that data at the time. Um, they gave Mr. Snyder the raw data, which he had to kind of analyze, but we didn't have it available to us at that time. Um, the next meeting is to be determined. Um, but again, a lot of the focus was around really how are we working to engage the community, engage community partners um, around the totality of school safety. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Next next committee meeting would it's, it's to be determined. Also, okay. we're going to look at getting more student representation um, on that particular committee was one of the, the takeaways as well. So next steps are to review the school climate survey data, um, school safety, prioritize school safety focus areas, and then analyze the strategic plan for alignment and recommendations. Thank you. Um, student Code of Conduct Committee, there was no meeting. And then wellness committee met on June 13th. No, it didn't. It didn't? No, there was no meeting. There was no meeting. Okay. Moving on to items submitted by the board. Uh, Mr. Leonard, um, just kind of recap attendance zones, feeder patterns. Yeah, I just, uh, as I mentioned in the uh, task force uh, update, uh, I'd like to propose that we uh, have a policy that uh, addresses uh, reviewing attendance zones uh, since it's decades in between, and uh, I'd like us to discuss that today and uh, hopefully uh, have that sent to uh, the policy review committee uh, for discussion. So everyone should have a copy of that. Uh, if you bring that up, it was uh, attached to the agenda. Are there any questions? So I see this as an action item for next month. Are there any questions or comments regarding the proposal, Dr. Bohm? I think it would be wonderful to have a committee that reviews the attendance zones every 10 years. I would say to do it even every five years, maybe, to do it a little sooner, but I, I just think that's a wonderful policy. 
Other comments of Ms. Thompson? Yeah, so I think that we can send the concept of it. Well, first of all, I think we're a little out of order. I think that the task force should provide all its recommendations so that we can act and not take it one, one piece at a time. But even if there is a, it, I know you drafted something, but what we typically do is send a concept to the policy review committee and they draft it. So I think that's, if we're going to take this approach, I think that's the way to do it because your policy isn't even what the task force recommended and it's very unclear as to what is required. And we have many schools, we have several schools with a lower attendance uh, capacity than AI High School and there's no fix those schools and nobody has raised any issue about them. And you talk about equity in it, but I don't even know what that means because does that mean the number of students? Does that mean the racial composition of the students? Does that mean, what, what does that mean? So I, first of all, I think we ought to hear first from the attendant, from the, the, the task force, because we charge them with coming up with recommendations. I'd like to hear what their recommendations are before undertaking action. But if this board does decide to undertake action, my, pre, my, my proposal would be that we send the concept to board policy for board policy to that what they do is they look around and see what others have and draft up and find out what the best practice is and draft up something to bring back get community input and bring that back and get some more community input. Thank you. I have a, I have yes, a comment. Okay. Uh, if you recall, am I, am I on here? If you recall, uh, Ms. Thompson, uh, I did bring that up at the board policy committee meeting and you, you told me that must be approved by the board first, then go to the board policy review committee. So I'm kind of confused myself on what the process is. So here I am for the second month, bringing it to the board. Uh, from the board policy committee, which I was told needs to come from the board. So which is, and I, I'm not clear. I think I, it's perfectly clear. I think it's perfectly clear what the process is, Mr. Leonard. And I don't think it's deviated from that. I'm not taking, I'm taking issue with the practice because it doesn't, the board needs to, an individual board member has no real authority. Any action that's taken is taken by a vote of the board. So if you want to send something to board policy, the board is the one that has to do it, not you individually. That's very clear. Number two, what I'm saying is, as to the content of your proposal, of what you drafted, I have a problem with the way you approached it because what is typically done is that the concept is sent to board policy for board policy to draft it, not what you not draft a policy and send it to board policy. And two, the third point is what you've even drafted or brought forth is inconsistent with what the task force is proposing. And I think we ought to hear everything the task force has proposed before we undertake action to begin with. So I don't know what's unclear about that. So I have a um, couple of thoughts and comments. So I appreciate uh, you attempting to draft, Mr. Leonard, the attendance zone review policy. Um, and so what my recommendation is, is that you have brought up the desire to have a policy for our school board and district to review attendance zones, not just at AI, but in general, Correct. every 10 years. And so my recommendation is that next month, the, the motion would be to create an attendance policy zone attendance zone review policy share this draft with the board review policy committee who would then revamp it bring it to the board for presentation listen have a first read once that committee comes up with that policy and then a second read and then we would vote to approve it or not so you took an extra step that you didn't have to do to try to create something to share. And I appreciate that. And so what we will do for action items next month, if that's okay, and whoever's running that meeting, it would be to for you to make the re recommendation to create an attendance zone review policy. And then it would go to the board review policy, is that okay? Yes, okay. Okay, 
Can we make sure that's in the notes for next meeting? Okay. I will I will note it and I will send out the email to everyone. I just I just want to make sure his mic is not on. I just want to make sure again, just in terms of policy creation process, that we give the committee the due diligence to actually investigate to create a policy to bring to the board. And I think just around like policy eight thousand five which was a similar process and that the board gave the policy review, the policy review committee, the, ch the charge to give the board to something to respond to. That's so, what I'm saying. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure that, so basically what I'm hearing the board say in this instance is you want the policy to review the committee to investigate an attendance zone review policy. And the only stipulation that I'm hearing is that that policy be reviewed every 10 years. Or, or that attendance zones within that policy look at a, 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 a 10 year review. That's what the request is for to be included in the whatever it comes up as the actual policy. Okay, yeah. So, so they I, would do their so the board review committee would would create the policy based on the charge, right? There were, the whole committee would discuss, which has board members on it and other stakeholders in the district. Create the do the investigation, do create the policy. This is a process that would have just happened overnight. Yeah, so that's why I just wanted to make yeah. sure we're clarifying so that there's not an expectation that July there's a first reading and then August there's a second it's reading for you to actual vote reading. on. So okay. The motion would be to create the motion would be to create to have the to create the policy at the board review level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Any other discussion on that topic? Okay, moving yes. on. Yes. yes. Okay, well, sorry. Dr. Buck. I'm in full support of that. I also support it. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, next item. Wilmington Learning Collaborative Council seat. Um, so we discussed uh, with Dr. Bones' departure, uh, her retirement. Um, we She served as our, our seat, and so we just kind of had to have a discussion, I, I think, at least at the very least around how we would determine uh, who would sit on that, sit on the Wilmington Learning Collaborative because we have two city seats. I know I did speak with um, income, incoming member um, Ajay English when, right? um, and she is interested. So I just wanted to have a discussion around that now, and then we can kind of go from there. Go ahead. Mr. Matthews. Oh, I just wanted to clarify. We have um, three. I also have a portion of the city as well. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yep. And I'll let Dr. I, and, and the only reason why I wanted the for the board to have this conversation because there's been conversation on the WLC council that the seating body, and you had that conversation publicly with Dr. Bohm taking that seat to make sure, obviously, in full transparency moving forward with Mr. Matthews taking part of the city that as the board has that conversation with July and who's serving on committees, that that be a part of that process now that there's representation from the board on the WLC. Other comments, discussion? That should be uh, when we uh, ask somebody to step up in July, correct? Correct. All right, well, I think that'd be a good time. So I guess, you know. I, I guess that what we're trying to determine is what is, what is gonna be our process for selecting that person. And this is an open discussion, Dr. Bo. So I would just like to say that the District A seat is the only seat that only has the city city limits within that seat, you know, representative, representative body. So I know Mr. Matthews has a portion of the city and Mr. Uh, no. Wilson has a portion of the city, but District A has the entire city. So therefore, Ms. Ajay English Wynn should inherit the District A seat that I currently possess. I have the B seat. So I, it, may, it may be me. I'm so, saying what my opinion is, that Ms. Really? Ajay English Wynn should inherit the seat I currently possess because she will have the entire city within her jurisdiction as a uh, nominating representative for District A. You have a portion of the city as yeah. Mr. Matthews has a portion of the yeah. city. So if it's going to be based on having a proportion, then you and Mr. Matthews would both be up to potentially possess that seat. But Miss English Wynn has the entire city. That's her nominating district. She doesn't have any suburban area. And that's literally what the Wilmington Learning Collaborative is focusing on. 
what to do in Wilmington with Wilmington residents spearheading that effort? So I don't have a particular opinion. I'm trying to be impartial to the whole thing. But what I do want to figure out is whenever, so this is a new body. And so the first year Dr. Bohm served on it, and which, which was great and relevant. Mm -hmm. um, as we go forward, when a, when a person, whether it's this election cycle, next election cycle, I just want us to have a procedure for how we determine that seat is filled because it, for example, let's say in 10 years, um, is, it, is it to be assumed that the person in District Z, whatever District A, B, C, whatever it is, is to assume that C, is that an expectation of our board or is that something that we would continue to discuss each election cycle change? Um, I did see Ms. Thompson, I saw Mr. Bonson and, and then Dr. Bone. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, during the whole MOU process for the WLC, there was a recognition that Red Clay had two city seats and those were A and B. And, the, and an issue was how do we determine which, since one representative, the other, the other districts, so Christina and um, Brandywine only have one city district. We had two, and we kept talking about that as well as the process for determining who was going to sit on, in that seat. And I believe what we need to do is just like we do for committees, we nominate people, and then if we, and if we have more than one, then we'll have to vote. Mr. Wilson and then Dr. Bohm. Dr. Bohm. Um, I also want to say for the public record, the person who possesses the District A seat is the only person who lives in the city of Wilmington. All other six members of this board live in the suburbs. It is the Wilmington Learning Collaborative. I do not understand why that's a difficult concept to comprehend. It is a, it is a collaborative consisting primarily of people who live in the city of Wilmington who are trying to figure out how to best move forward in regard to the state of our city schools. Those are city seats for people who live in the city. Mr. Wilson has shared on numerous occasions he lives in Pike Creek. And, so you don't live the in the city, city of Wilmington, 41 years. Yes, but so you don't live in the I city have, of Wilmington. I'm speaking. I have, point of order. Speaking, point of order. Point of order. Time. Dr. Bone was speaking. I'm on the floor. You have shared on a number of occasions that you do not live in Wilmington. You own a house in Wilmington. You have shared that, but you live with your wife in Pike Creek. You have shared that as well. It's on the public record. You said that the judge gave you an order that said you could live in the suburbs and still hold the district B C. You haven't shared that paperwork with us, but you have shared that that, that occurred on a number of occasions. So what I am saying is Ms. Ajay English Wynn, who is taking over the district A C, actually lives in the city of Wilmington and therefore she should be the representative on the Wilmington Learning Collaborative. So the points that I've heard um, are that district A should hold the seat for this upcoming year, I'm guessing. And I and I don't, you know, I don't have an opinion about that overall that I'm speaking about right now. Uh, I also heard that we should nominate that person of, out of the, the one and the two partial seats. Um, the thing I'm most concerned about is setting a precedent. And then so in 10 years, when a person runs for seat A, are they expected to sit or is that something that the board would decide? So that's why the conversation is coming up, not to negate um, the potential, you know, reclamation of that seat, um, but just to be clear as a board, how we're going to move forward with processes. So um, other discussions? Excellent. I, I, I like what you just said. We will be able to move forward with this in July. Uh, as of right now, we can hear everything. Miss IJ may not even want this job. We don't know yet, but I'm just saying it is open, whether it's Jose, whether it's me or Miss Miss IJ, but we'll deal with this in July. Any other discussion? All right, now that we've discussed that, my opinion uh, is that to, to have the continuity of the work, 
that has been started with Dr. Bohm and 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 having a full seat in Wilmington, I would I my suggestion would be I would I would potentially nominate Miss English Wynn so that she can continue the work because she's been working in that because that that seat is is part is all the city and just because it's at the beginning of the Wilmington Learning Collaborative, it might behoove us to have someone who is whose child goes to school there who's dedicated, but not to say that that's the precedent. I just don't want to set a precedent where we have a person who sits in seat A, they must be on the Wilmington Learning Collaborative because that might not be something that a future person might want. So we can, I think, I think we can bring this up again next month because um, we, we have to have that person ready to serve right after July 30th. So what is the next meeting for Wilmington Learning Collaborative? Well, the vote was we were bi-weekly or bi-monthly, excuse me. Um, so I think the next meeting is July 18th. Which is after our okay. Which is after the meeting. And so again, for I say, would say all intents and purposes, you've heard feedback. The board would just have to make a decision because the only stipulation is the governing body, which is the board for a whole host of reasons. Like that's to say someone had a health issue or there was something that really impacted whomever serves on the WLC council for the board, the board has to just have a process to do it. And, you know, there's yeah. a valid point to be made. I just think the board just needs to honor that and then move forward in July. And so perhaps in the organizational meeting, we will, just, we will, we Correct. will do that. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other discussion on this topic? Well, I do want to say one thing, okay. and I just, I know um, Martin has run for office for the school board at least four times, and it may be five, I'm not sure. And every time one runs, one has to go to the Department of Elections, and they determine where your residence is. So Mr. Wilson's residence has been determined to be on Van Buren Street. I don't know, I don't have any other evidence about where he lives. I understand that they also, he also has a house in Pike Creek, but the Department of Elections at least four times, if not five times, has determined that he lives downtown. And I, I just think it's really inappropriate for this board to not come up with facts if they're gonna dispute something about someone and, and, and take issue with someone because the facts are, the, the Delaware Department of Elections has determined that his residence is in Wilmington. Ms. Dr. Neesmith. Yes, go I have ahead. a comment. Go ahead. And that's nice, but Mr. Wilson has shared with this board that he does not live in Wilmington. He, in fact, said nobody wants to live in Wilmington because everybody shoots everybody up. And I responded and said, well, some of us do like to live in Wilmington, and we love to live in Wilmington, including me and my children and my husband. And we send our kids to school in Wilmington. And we're proud to live in the city of Wilmington. Proud so the department, I am have the floor, Mr. Wilson. So it's nice if the Department of Elections says something, that's fine and good. Lots of people own multiple houses. But what I am saying is that Mr. Wilson has shared out of his own mouth that he does not live in Wilmington. So don't say to me that I have misconstrued facts, Ms. Thompson, because that is an utter and bold-faced lie. And we know that there have been investigations done about where Mr. Wilson lives, and you know that. All of and that's what I'm saying, that he has said he doesn't live in Wilmington. Okay, so we're going to move on. Hold on. Because I, what, I, 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 I will. One thing to say. Okay, so. Because you said that. Yeah, you. The new person. Let me finish what I was saying. Hold on. I'm not, ta I'm not talking oh, to you. Oh, I, I wasn't talking great. to you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson, you can say what you need to say, but we're going to move on after this Thank because you. it's yes. becoming confusing. Yes, because point we, of order, we only move. Go ahead, Mr. Wilson. Off, point of order, floor. we only move forward and cut off discussion when the board determines it, and the board has to determine. Go ahead, Mr. Wilson. Okay, I was just going to clarify when you said that Asia have one child. Ajay. Ajay, have one <laughs> child. I have a first one nephew that will be starting kindergarten and Highland this upcoming year. I have about maybe eight or nine kids, relatives, right in the city, in my district, 
that will be going to schools and some in a, a section. I'm not going to get in a contest of this. I've already went through with the Department of Elections and the court and the judge granted this. And I'm not going to start this all over again. I promise God I would not do this again, but we'll deal with this in July. Thank I'm you. Done. Thank you. And for just everybody understand the, the there was not a motion for this discussion. So I am moving on. Uh, information items, is anyone there? We have choice program, choice terminations, vendor contracts, DSBA dues renewal, 2023 DSBA legislative committee officers, uh, administrative memo research, freedom of information request. And I have one reflection. Um, I'd like to say thank you to the board for the opportunity to serve as president this year. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't speak to um, Dr. Bone to say thank you. Um, you have been instrumental in helping me to become a board member. And I know we don't always see eye to eye, but I do respect you and I do appreciate your advocacy and your hard work. Um, and you are something to be reckoned with. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to seeing you in other venues and leadership as well. Uh, as I embark on this uh, reflection of my year, and, I, and I'm doing this because um, I want to just share a few things. It's been a very inopportune, inopportune time to serve um, for me personally, but in the words of Frederick Douglass, if there's no struggle, there is no progress. This year, I strive to bring order to the rhythm of meetings, engage our board in investigative inquiry into the why or how of our practices and policies that guide our work. And after the first couple of months of gaining my bearings, worked, I worked to elevate the vo voices of our members even if it resulted in 100 discussion items, debate or cognitive dissonance like we've seen tonight. I believe that the work of the board is critical and as we embark on the new year with a new board, we must be willing to change and improve rather than continue to uphold the status quo, especially if the way we have always done things no longer serves us or brings about clarity, consensus or progress. I challenge myself and all board members to take time to reflect, regroup, forgive, and forge ahead toward a more amicable and positive working relationship that will result in positive outcomes and that we demonstrate a willingness to change because our kids and our district are watching us and are depending on us. And I look forward to supporting the soon to be newly elected president and vice president of the board as they lead us into the 2023-24 school year. It's been an honor to serve as president and I look forward to what's to come. Our next board meeting will be on July 12th, 2023 at 7 p.m. here at Cab Calloway School. May I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Have a safe, relaxing, and fun summer. Absolutely.